Hey, what's up everyone? It's your boy, the one and only Twan Dixon, licensed professional counselor in the state of Alabama and the state of Georgia. Make sure you tune in to Talk Live Tuesday on the Boom Network at 10 p.m. And remember, Tag did it. Boom. Everybody, everybody go. Everybody, everybody go. Run and tag. What's up, y'all? Welcome to Talk Live Tuesdays at Tag. It's your boy Tag Diddy. Y'all already know what it is. Listen, tonight downtown in the loft in Atlanta, Georgia, we have my therapist, my friend, my big brother, none other than Twan Dixon here on the couch with me tonight. Twan, what's going on? I am. I'm here. You're here? I am finally here. You done got me on the road. I'm glad to have you. And drove all the way from Birmingham. Yes. Here. Well, you know, I was at homecoming. Yeah, you was at homecoming. And then I just... Came on up, pushed on up. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that too. But um, y'all already know how I do. We're gonna shout out the businesses real quick. Tonight I'm not doing the lavish hookahs, but make sure you have the lavish hookah. Make sure you're following us on Instagram at lavish hookahs official. But make sure you also follow me on Instagram at tag did it. You're gonna follow the boom network on YouTube, and you're gonna also follow Talk Live Tuesdays on Instagram at Talk Live Tuesdays. I know I did all that backwards today, you guys, but guess what? It's been a day. But let me tell you, I got my therapist here. We're gonna have some conversation. And hopefully I'm able to get a little better. But y'all already know, Twan Dixon. Yes. Tell the people where they can possibly follow you because you know you do not do Instagram. But I let them know what, where, where they can where they can um, get some services or something. I no, I don't do the Instagram. I will potentially allow people to follow me at Twan Dixon LPC on the local Facebook. On the local Facebook. Or you can find me on Psychology Today. Psychology Today. Yeah, psychologytoday.com. Excuse me. Psychologytoday.com. Yes. You're going to follow Mr. Dixon there. And if you need some services, he is registered in... I am licensed in Alabama as mm -hmm. well as the state of Georgia as a licensed professional counselor. Okay, we're going to get into yeah. that. Um, so, of course, you know on my show, I'm going to start out with an icebreaker. I haven't, okay. I haven't done an icebreaker in a while, but I did one last episode and the episode before that, so okay. I want to do one for you. Okay. Um, but... Being that we're going to talk about therapy and, you mm -hmm. know, you being a therapist in the black community as well as mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you is, at what point do you think someone should consider going to therapy? At any point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I always say this, don't wait too late. Mm -hmm. Like if you know, especially when you're getting older and you start to realize that, you know, in your adult life, some things are kind of resurfacing from childhood that you probably just can't manage. And it's just kind of altering your mood, altering your emotions and how you feel and respond and react to things. Then that's probably a good indicator that you should get into therapy. Also... The people closest to you, mm -hmm. they'll kind of see it as well, mm -hmm. and they'll probably suggest it. And of course, it's hard for us to listen to people that are closest to right. us because we, we think, well, they don't know what they're talking about. So I always say, if you start to feel a change within, and you know it's becoming unmanageable, and you can't you can't seem to find that balance, get into therapy. Get into therapy. Get into it. Okay. Um, I want to ask now, because of course, and I'm pretty sure this will come back up later on, but mm -hmm. being in the black community when it comes to therapy, do you think that that's something that African Americans suggest to people, especially, you know, being that therapy is kind of looked down upon in the black community? Uh, therapy, still to this day, mm -hmm. um, still in the black community, still does have that stigma. Mm -hmm. And it, it is not advocated as mm -hmm. much. It is just now starting to become widely advocated mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. Because even for me, as a licensed counselor, I go to therapy. Mm -hmm. And I shared this on Friday night at an event that I had spoke at. Um, that I actually did not start going to therapy myself until I was a licensed professional counselor. Mm -hmm. And I really did not start taking therapy serious until I was licensed in Georgia. Hmm. Yeah. 
And so, you know, growing up in the black community and from what I've seen in my own experience, it was always, oh, just pray about it. Mm -hmm. Trust God. Let go. Let God. It was mm -hmm. always that. Mm -hmm. It was always just the advocating on the church and the religion and mm -hmm. the spiritual side of things. It was never anything about let's let's get you some help. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in essence, it's still kind of that way. Yeah. But I think now that people in our community, in the black community, in the LGBT community, when they see us that work in this profession, right. they know, okay, it's okay right. for me to get help. I agree. I literally, honestly, you know, and we'll talk about when I first met you, but I was like, I wanted to get there, but I was like, I... Didn't know what route to go, how to go about it. I had searched online. I had friends that sent me, like, you know, online therapists mm -hmm. where you can talk to them online, text mm -hmm. them through the computer or do FaceTime calls or whatever case may mm -hmm. have you. And I just didn't know what direction to go until I, you know, until I was connected with you. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely agree with you. And I definitely right. think that, um, you know, that stigma is still out there. But we do have to find a way to... Um, get around that mm -hmm. and I hope that we can get um, share some of that tonight yeah, yeah. Um, okay. definitely um, so Alabama raised yes. um, how was it growing up in Alabama different <laughs> and, and what made it so different like like talk, talk to me well you know i grew up in birmingham mm -hmm. and of course birmingham has this stigma that oh there's nothing going on in birmingham mm -hmm. there's nothing to do that may be true in some instance, but mm -hmm. I always have something to do. Right. Um, but I definitely grew up in Birmingham. Um, definitely grew up raised in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I am a PK, a mm -hmm. preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I always lived under this microscope. Right. Um, especially growing up, we were always set apart mm -hmm. from like the regular kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a... My upbringing was with my grandparents. Okay. My grandmother raised me. My grandfather raised me um, because my parents were like 16 or 17 mm -hmm. when I was born. So they wasn't equipped to right. raise me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had a very, looking looking back over my life as an adult now, I had a very good upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I went through different things and, you know, this year being 25 years of me being a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. um, so I went through different things growing up, but it was all for the betterment of where mm -hmm. I am today. Right. And so many people always say, oh, you should move to Atlanta. You should move to Atlanta. I'm like, okay, well, no, I shouldn't because I haven't, I haven't felt that niche to move to mm -hmm. Atlanta. And plus given uh, people that I have had friendships with before, mm -hmm. just kind of seeing what their outcome has mm -hmm. been here in Atlanta. Um, He's shady. Guys. I am. <laughs> um, I did not want that to be my right. journey, even though it wasn't going to be my journey because mm -hmm. I am self-sufficient yeah. and I am a go-getter and yeah. I, I don't depend on others. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Atlanta was not my area to move. And that's not to say it never will be. Right. Um, but growing up in Alabama, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about switching lanes. And I <laughs> right. Stay in my one little lane, get off on my one little exit, and I'm fine. And, and, keep, it, and keep it going. And keep it going. Now, so. being a preacher's kid, like, how was that? Because when you said um, that pretty much, like, when people talk about therapy and back mm -hmm. in the it's always... God will do it for your prayer, mm -hmm. you know, whatever case may have you. But I like to say, and when, when I hear people say that, I'd be like, you know, yes, you can pray and God will lead you mm -hmm. to help you. But I feel like God has put people on this earth to help you through certain situations. Yeah. God, God can only do so much from being, right. he, he can work miracles, he but guess what? If you have, if he's placed people, that's what he placed doctors here for right. to help you get through, you know, sickness and things like mm -hmm. that. He placed, you know... Pilots here to fly you through the air to get you back some back and forth quicker. So he placed therapists here to have to like to help people mm -hmm. get through those difficult and emotional times in their right. life, even if it's not even something emotional, but something that just feel like they don't know how to get over. I feel like mm -hmm. that's what they put you here for. So right. how was it being a preacher's kid growing up? Um, being a preacher's kid growing up was um, was not fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was not fun. At all, but I will say this because my grandmother, she she was the preacher, she was an evangelist. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, and of course, my grandmother passed away in 2016. But I'm, I always honor her. I always give her her flowers when she was alive, yeah. and I keep those flowers alive even in death. Okay, as you should, as you and so um, 
she raised me, but a lot of people only knew her as a preacher, as an evangelist, mm-hmm. and they knew her as a nurse, but they did not know her as the educator mm-hmm. that disciplined me, that, mm-hmm. that provided me structure. Mm-hmm. I can remember, and this is not to be racist to anyone that's watching, but I can remember my senior year of high school, and she and I went to Cracker Barrel mm-hmm. for breakfast one morning. Mm-hmm. And I had I didn't know what school I wanted to go to yet. I had applied for different schools. Mm. And I thought that I was supposed to go to an HBCU. I thought mm. that that's what black people are supposed to do. Mm. And I'll never forget, she looked over at, you know, Cracker Barrel on Saturday mornings, mm-hmm. is, you know, Caucasian people. Yeah, me and my daddy used to go there. Absolutely. She looked over He's and Caucasian. said, she Not said, really. no, you can go to the school that they built. Hmm. And that's what I did. She always instilled in me more than what I probably believed in myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So being raised by a preacher, it was fun. It definitely was. It had its moments. It had Mm -hmm. its challenges Mm -hmm. because of just the certain standard that we had to kind of follow. And then for me being a gay, (laughs) a gay boy. Right. Right. (laughs) You know, coming up in the church. Now, that was the hard part. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where a lot of my personal trauma has come in and mm-hmm. and that's a lot of things that me and my therapist address in therapy so we don't it's not about me being gay mm-hmm. <laughs> i'm gay right but, we're, we're gonna be that, we're gonna be that. <laughs> but it was definitely it's definitely about me addressing yeah. that hurt that trauma that i went through mm-hmm. um and there were things that my grandmother's colleagues preaching colleagues said and did to me that i never told her right that I never told her. I wish I would have told her, but I just know for her, she would she mm-hmm. would have turned it up. She yeah. would have like stepped outside of the preacher role yeah. about me because she didn't play about me. Yeah. So that's where the challenge came in at how I was treated mm-hmm. by the other preachers. Right. And what were some of those things that were said to you? If you don't, oh my if, goodness! If you don't mind like opening up about that. Yeah. So in the church that I come from, and I called them out on the local Facebook the other day, <laughs> and I think you saw that post. I I probably did. Yes. I called them out on the local Facebook and several of the preachers actually jumped in my inbox uh, and they were like, hey, can you change your post to some of the preachers? I said, no, you're all lumped in that category. Right. Because what it was, I shared a status mm-hmm. and the status was, uh, hey, all the church dropouts, why did you drop out of church? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I stopped going to church because I got tired of the preachers at said church. Mm-hmm. Not going to give them that type of credit on this show. Mm-hmm. At said church, trying to pray the gay out of me, and I put three laughing emojis, and I ended my caption with "prayer still not answered." Period. Mm. And so, mm. you know, so of course, several of the preachers they were just like, "Oh my God, can you just go back and edit and say, well, some of the preachers?" I said, "No, I'm not going to say that. Right. I'm not going to keep saving you right. because of what you guys did right. to me." And so, yeah, I can remember a time when I was 13 years old, and um, I had went to the altar at mm-hmm. church for prayer because I mm-hmm. I had a really bad headache, mm-hmm. and the female evangelist that was preaching that morning, I told her, she said, "What do you need prayer for?" I said, "Well, I came up here because I got a headache and she literally got in my ear and was like speaking in tongues and was like lord we're gonna cast out this gay demon i was like what the hell girl i didn't ask for all that and so she literally and she was like trying to get me to fall on the ground and trying to get the gay demon up out of me and fast forward um i ran into her she and i uh at at a period of time worked out at the same gym Mm -hmm. She no longer works out there. Mm-mm. And so um, I saw her and I got to looking on the social media and, and her youngest daughter. And yes, I'm going to be shady. Her, uh-uh. her youngest daughter is now her youngest son. Wait, she transitioned? She didn't transition, but she's thugged out. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you know, you ever yeah. seen when P. Diddy did like making the band mm-hmm. and like those female thugged out rappers? Mm-hmm. Like she's real hardcore. Like, <laughs> 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 so I was like, oh my God, Karma is such a bitch. I mean, yeah. like I be seeing her on like on the Facebook, like with like the pistols mm-hmm. and, and you know, the, you know, making it rain. Making it rain, making it money. On the drop top And it, it, it be crazy because, you know, some preachers, people, like people that, be trying to condemn that or say, you know, 
it's this, it's that, and turn out one of their kids or somebody that they're close to ends up being that way or doing yeah. something along those lines. So it's just like, it's, it's so weird. It is so weird. But the thing is, I honestly have forgiven them, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that particular preacher, right. because now you're having to deal with mm -hmm. that, you know, with one of your own children. Right. Now, you know, being a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't a good feeling right. because, once again, like I said, prayer's still not answered. I'm, right. I'm still. 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 I'm we'll, still, he's still, we still. Okay. Tomorrow, <laughs> still. Thank you. Still. Okay. And so, no. Yeah, so that's how it's always been this trying to pray the gay out of me, trying to pray the gay out of me. Even another instance, um, I used to be in the choir growing up. Mm -hmm. Yes, a bitch can tune. <laughs> and so I was on the program for like the Christmas concert or something. Uh -huh. And our our church administrator who wears like these pastel suits. Um, outside of the Easter holidays, mm -hmm. um, he was just like, okay, when you get up there and you get up there and you do the welcoming occasion, put some bass in your voice. I used to hate that. My dad used to tell me that all the time. Like, I, that this, is, this is me, stink. Right. And that is so traumatizing. Yeah. That is so traumatizing. Because I used like, to try to do it. I used to try to put some dap in my walk and all that kind of stuff. Child, I ain't never tried this shit. <laughs> I ain't never tried. <laughs> and I'm not going to. But that was traumatizing. Mm -hmm. That was hurtful. Yeah. That you tried to change my character. Yeah. You tried to change who I was. Yeah. And as I got older, and this was before I even thought about being a counselor. Mm -hmm. A bitch went to school for nursing. Let me put that out there. But I knew as I got older and I became who I am. Mm -hmm. And I have such an extroverted personality type. Yeah. I knew that I was no longer going to allow people to control my narrative. Yeah, as you shouldn't. As I should. As you shouldn't. And yeah. I and I think that since I met you, that's something that I've been growing into mm -hmm. too. Like stop letting people control my narrative and control who I am. Mm -hmm. Be me right. a hundred percent wholeheartedly and whoever loves it, they love it. If they don't, they don't, and they're not just meant to be in my space or in my life. Mm -hmm. And and I, I definitely agree. Um on everything you just said. So yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad that you, you know, overcame that because let me tell you, I had a instance like that. I was a praise dancer mm -hmm. back um when I was growing up. Um yes guys, we are drinking water today because I am trying to be a little wholesome today with Mr. Dixon on the couch. Absolutely. Now Mr. Dixon may have had a drink. What? <laughs> Who knows? Um, no. Welcome but, to uh, Tall Line Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> um, but no, I had an instance like that. I was praise dancing and um, the preacher came to me. He was a prophet. Mm -hmm. And um, when he told me to come up to the thing or whatever case may have you, and I came up and he was asking me in my ear, um, was I gay? Mm -hmm. And all these things. Mm -hmm. and asking all that. And, I, and I, it, it appalled me because mind you, I'm in the church with mm -hmm. my Praise Dance team, which were the majority mm -hmm. females at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, although I was gay, it's like, why would you try to call me out knowing mm -hmm. that? And I'm in, not, as if I'm not in the church doing something, dancing for the Lord. Like, I, Praise Dance was probably one of the favorite, my most favorite things that I've ever done in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, like, made me not want to do it anymore because mm -hmm. it was just like, if this is what's going to happen when I go to churches, instead of you seeing the talent or the, the, Ministry or this, what I'm putting out, mm -hmm. you're pretty much trying to just say, "Oh, well, you're only doing this because you're gay." This what like, but you know how many other boys that probably praise this, you yeah. probably won't call them out yeah. because, or it may have been your pray, your son, I may have bring mm -hmm. whoever in the church, but you did that to me because it was a team full of girls and said, and I was the yeah. only guy, and that's how I felt. And then he got to the end of the church and asked me, "Did that hurt my feelings? Mm -hmm. Did that make me feel some type of way?" And mm -hmm. if I needed him, call him, and I never talked to this guy ever again in my yeah. life. But that was a moment for me that really hurt me growing yeah. up because it was just like, damn, like. As a, as someone that is trying to do something positive in mm -hmm. as a young adult, because mm -hmm. you don't see young people. I was like maybe what, 15, 16 at the time. Mm -hmm. You don't see people my age wanting to praise them and wanting to be in a church and doing those things or even participate. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time, you know, growing up, we were forced to go to church. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just like the fact that I wanted to engage and the fact that I wanted to be a part of the ministry and do that. But for you, the only thing you saw in me, oh, you're gay and let me tell me. Yeah. He did the same thing. Pray, pray to my ear, mm -hmm. speaking in tongues, all that kind of stuff. And it's just like, to this day, I'm still who I am. And I yeah. feel like I'm so blessed yes. by being completely who I am. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I share this with you, and I always have told people this, especially when I, you know, once again, coming into who I am. Right. If he did not love me, meaning God, yes. he wouldn't bless me. Amen. And you know how blessed I am. Yeah, I know. I'm very blessed. Very blessed. Very. Yeah. Like, for real. Yeah. Like, I... <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not going to stop being blessed. As you should. And I'll share this with you. You know, I will say this. Mm -hmm. in, in my church growing up, um, all of the guys mm -hmm. had like male figures that they can go to. Like the adult males always embrace the other guys. Mm -hmm. Because I am the OG homosexual from mm -hmm. my childhood church. Okay. Now, present day, they're very open to the homosexual community. Mm -hmm. So, to the girls out there, I walk so you can run. Okay? <laughs> oh! Oh, yeah, I did do that. And when I do walk into the doors mm -hmm. of that particular church, mm -hmm. they do bow down to me. And they roll out the red carpet for me. Like, for real. Because mm -hmm. they know better. Um, but I watched how all the men gravitated and embraced the other men mm -hmm. but no one took the time to invest in me right there was only one male preacher that invested into me and that was our assistant pastor mm -hmm. and he was like a godfather to me and of mm -hmm. course he transitioned um he passed away from covid he oh, was actually wow. one of the um he he passed away in like of august of 2020 so at the yeah. height of this thing right. Um, so, you know, I, I miss him dearly. That's actually my best, my childhood best friend. That's her dad. Mm -hmm. Her parents are the only preachers that have ever took the time to invest in me. Yeah. And even her mom, who's like a godmother to me, still invests in me to this day and have just always loved me. Yeah. But nobody else in leadership not even my own pastor mm. who only gave me $50 when I went off to college, mm. but was constantly investing financially into other people that went off to college around mm. the same time that I did. Mm. And that was okay. That was okay. Because even now I've had to learn what being unsupported looks like right. even in my own family right. you know what i'm saying but that doesn't stop me from keep pushing yeah you know what i'm saying As you should. and that's why i would say you have to keep pushing, pushing too yeah. you know whether people support you or not you got to keep pushing yeah because if you if i don't you know you're gonna still be in the same spot waiting right. for somebody else to be, get behind you absolutely and push with you. So, uh-huh you know, yeah. You gotta push by yourself. Absolutely. You gotta push by yourself. Well, we're gonna take a quick break really quick, Mr. Dixon. Okay. And once we take this quick break, we're gonna come back because I definitely want to um I do wanna talk about um before we get into more about your counseling and things mm -hmm. like that, I do want to talk to you about, you know, your relationship with your parents. Yes. And also I did want to talk to you about um, you know, you being a cancer survivor. <laughs> All right, y'all. Welcome back to Talk Lives Tuesdays a Tag. We are here on the couch with Mr. Dixon, yeah. and we are getting into the things of the things. Uh, y'all know I be trying to get through the through the through the stuff, but his upbringing is really mm -hmm. has really you know been a lot right now because I'm actually feel like I'm getting to know you even more right. in, in this moment. Right. So, um, you know, I said I'm gonna talk about your parent relationship. Like, mm -hmm. how's your relationship with your parents now as an adult? Um, it it is a working thing mm -hmm. and i and i mean that with just positiveness right. okay so of course um my parents were like 16 17 years old mm -hmm. or 17 going on 18 when i was born yeah. my dad's birthday is actually next week okay. so he'll be 53 okay. um and of course i'm 35 so that's right 17 yeah. and a half years yeah. 18 years or whatnot um and so just growing up um of course they they were absent a lot mm -hmm. they were um, because there was things going on with the adults right. that I was unaware of. Right. Okay. And of course there are different versions to all the stories. Right. Um, but it's up to me how I choose to navigate right. relationships. Right. Um, I will say this growing up, a lot of people thought that my grandmother was my mom's mom. Mm. Reason being is because um, I actually saw my mom more mm -hmm. than I saw my dad. Right. But, spoiler alert, 
my grandmother that raised me was actually my dad's mom. Oh, wow. And I had a lot of resentment towards my dad growing up because mm -hmm. I felt as though that you had the advantage that he, now I feel like I'm talking to him, that he had the advantage over my mom, mm -hmm. meaning you had a key. Mm -hmm. So my grandparents' home, your mm -hmm. parents, mm -hmm. you can come over anytime you want. Mm -hmm. You knew the alarm code. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask you for anything mm -hmm. but to spend time with me. Right. And you didn't. Right. My mom didn't have no key. Hell, my mom and grandmama didn't even really like each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that my mom still was more present. Yeah, she, made, she found a way. Yes. Um, and I can remember just a, probably a year or two before my grandmother passed away. It may have been a year. It may have been like several months before she passed away. We were, we were leaving church. Mm -hmm. And she said to me as we were leaving church, I almost put her out on the side of the road. <laughs> she said to me, she said, it's not that your dad does not love you. He just does not like your lifestyle. And Troy, when I tell you that pissed me off. I know it did. It did because here it is. I have gone to college. I have graduated with three college degrees from the PWI. And you didn't put me through school. I had to sign my life away and go to the army. And you've never came to a graduation except for the last one. You would tell me about I was a student at another school. And so it was it was just crazy. Right. For you to, for me to hear that, mm -hmm. and so um, I will say this: my grandmother's passing allowed me to let my wall down with my dad, um, because he did come up to me after the funeral, and he said, "Son, I just want to thank you for taking care of my mom all these years, mm -hmm. because I could not have done it like you did, mm -hmm. because I was a caregiver, okay. and my grandmother was just like, please make sure you." keep life as normal as possible so here it is she was sick i was taking care of her i was counseling trips i'm coming over here to atlanta to hang right. out with the girls that i used to be cool with um and i was just trying to keep life normal i'm you know taking care of the dogs and yeah. paying the bills mm -hmm. and just trying to keep life normal going to church trusting god praying and crying everybody asking me a million questions i'm having to repeat stuff yeah. and but you know present day my relationship with my parents like i said it's, it's a working thing mm -hmm. um my mom has four kids so mm -hmm. there are three boys and one girl and i i share this openly and candidly and i know my mom's watching yeah. but <laughs> hi mom <laughs> but i will say this um even though i am the oldest mm -hmm. um of my mom's kids and the mm -hmm. youngest is a freshman in college mm -hmm. i honestly can say and you know how they parents try to say oh i don't have a favorite mm -hmm. kid <laughs> shit <laughs> you're the favorite i'm not the favorite you're not the favorite i am not the favorite, Who the, favorite? the favorite i would say the overall favorite of mm -hmm. course it's my sister mm -hmm. by default because she's mm -hmm. the only girl mm -hmm. um but out of the boys mm -hmm. i'm number three you number three i'm number even though i'm the oldest mm -hmm. child i'm number three i'm the I'm the least favorite of my mom's kids. Mm. I know I am. Why? Um, because my mama don't be supporting stuff. Girl, she don't be supporting stuff. Like, she don't be supporting stuff I be needing her to support. Uh -huh. But it's all cool. We gonna yeah. have that conversation. Um, but definitely between my brother that's right after me who is 32 years old mm -hmm. and my 20 year old brother mm -hmm. it depends on the day the month the week which one of them is the favorite, but they, <laughs> they're the favorite. so they they in competition with each other yeah, so like right now i do know that my 32 year old brother is currently the favorite <laughs> yes out of the boys like child my mom be posting their accomplishments and stuff and i'm like girl where is when you gonna post about me? What I what about what I did? What about right. what I did? Right. <laughs> so but you know, I've had to learn to accept that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I do talk to my mom, you know, I do get frustrated when I see stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but I'm thankful for my mom's sister, my aunt, because she does work in this field as well. Right. And she's also a realtor. My auntie begins to the bag, child. Yeah, she, she gets to the bag and I don't blame her. She gets to the bag and I've learned how to get to the bag. By watching her, oh, yeah, you know, and she lives like ten minutes away from mm. me, and babe, I'd be like having to put the code in to get to her house. Mm. Get the game. Sus lives there. Sus could be a real housewife mm. with no husband. Let me see real housewives about here. And, let, and my auntie would be on there with her, <laughs> with her shy self, but. My auntie has always been able to fill in the gaps mm. where I felt like my mom 
could do better in. Yeah. And that's okay though. It's not to dis discredit my mom, yeah. but we do have a relationship that is working. Yeah. Um, and it works. It, it has to make sense for us. My dad, on the other hand, um, he's he. I, I know I'm not his ideal son, mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, my dad has um, a girlfriend who doesn't look like her name. And so, um, <laughs> she doesn't. What's her name? They call her Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> Does she have a peach? Does she have what? A peach. No, it's more like a prune. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe, you know, what those beets that come in the can? <laughs> this is going to studio job some beets. Can we, we can search around Puerto Rico to find us a studio. We can go drop some beets. Yeah. I don't really know her like that. <laughs> I cannot with you. You're our goddamn man. Sorry. But she, my dad's girlfriend, has sons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've never met any of her kids, but mm -hmm. I have seen images and stuff on, of, on the social media. Mm -hmm. And her sons are the type of sons that my dad wanted. I really wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do got a, you know, a brother on my dad's yeah. side or whatnot. Um, and, and that's his idea of son. Mm -hmm. So my dad and I, we have a relationship that just works for us. He mm -hmm. doesn't ask me about homosexuality. He don't ask me about no boyfriends or mm -hmm. anything of that nature. Yeah. We've never had that type of conversation. Yeah. He just strays away from mm -hmm. it. My dad has never even been in my house. My big old 23, 2400 square foot house. He's never been there. Never been there. He's, he's been to my house mm -hmm. um, because he, he used to, he had, when he was moving, he, had his mail getting delivered to my house. Yeah. And so he wanted me to mail him his mail. I'm not going to pay no money to mail your mail. Just come to my house and get yeah, it. Right. And he was like, well, can you put it in the bag and put it in your mailbox? So that's the furthest my dad has ever come to my house wow. is to my mailbox. And not, that, put it, not put it in a bag and put it in the mail. Babe, is it, it, was, a, it, was, it a, was that deep? It was that deep. It was in a Walmart bag. Hmm. Yeah, so he's never been to my house. And so stuff like that, that's like hurtful. Yeah. When your parent doesn't come. Yeah. I was like, I got yeah. a nice house, you know, yeah. but it is what it is. Um, so we have a relationship that I like to describe as it works for us. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if he needs me to take him to like a doctor's appointment or something, I'll do it. You yeah. know, I kind of handled the business side of things in our relationship. Yeah. And it is what it is. We talked to each other on holidays. So I haven't spoken to my dad since like Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. So his birthday is next week. So he'll get up. Happy birthday. Mm -hmm. And maybe on Christmas he'll get a text. Mm -hmm. It just kind of works that way. Gotcha. Yeah. And it just works. It, it, it works right now for us yeah. that way. Yeah. And well, are you willing to grow those relationships with your parents if they're willing to grow those relationships with you? Um, not right now. Not right now? And I'm going to tell you why. why. Because I think that um, so much time has passed and mm -hmm. so much has been planted mm -hmm. That um, I think that they need their own individualized therapy mm -hmm. to kind of connect with whatever traumatized them or hurt them. Mm -hmm. And then um, I am willing to have a conversation with a counselor mm -hmm. um, because I would like to hear them out, but I don't want to hear them out us one on one. Mm -hmm. I don't have time yeah, yeah. Um, because of the simple fact. I mean, I have so much going on mm -hmm. that I would love for them to be present at. Mm -hmm. But I share, I even shared this with my aunt the um, other day before I had my speaking engagement on mm -hmm. Friday. My aunt had asked me, she said, um, are your parents coming? And of course, my mom and dad hadn't, they're not, they, they ain't been together in 35 years. Yes. Okay. But she asked and I told her, no, I didn't invite them. And I said, well, auntie, I didn't invite them because I did not want to have to prepare for a disappointment. Mm -hmm. You get what right. I'm saying? Prepare for them not to even. Yeah. yeah. So like, when you know the outcome of something, mm -hmm. I don't even put my energy into it. Gotcha. So it was no use to me <laughs> fighting them. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I got you. I, and, and I understand. And that's valid. That's, yeah. that's very valid. Um, so we're going to switch gears really quick. Um, um, but for, for before we switch, because I do want to say that I hope that eventually at some point you do, you are able to heal those wounds and get in a better, a better place with them. I know what, I know that it works for you guys now, but right. I do hope that, uh, before time is lost that you yes. able to get that, get that, you know, un, you know, situations, um, handled because 
I feel the same way about like me and my like of course me and my parents have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. Like you know you you know I you know my I talk to my mom and my dad right. every day. I call them every day when I get off from work. Like it's not a day that I don't talk to them. And if mm-hmm. it is, my mom swears I'm acting funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but however, I do want to be able to talk about my life with my dad. I do want to be able to talk about that with him. I talk about it with my mom. With my mom. She knows who. Um, who Mr. Taurus is? We're not gonna speak on his name, but uh, when he knows, I Mr. love him. <laughs> he, she knows who Mr. Taurus is. She doesn't mind speaking. She always adds, like if if I'm not if I'm home and I'm not with him, where is he at? What 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 is he doing? Da, 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 da. Or oh, wait, is he what what city he in? What yeah. have you? So it's just like um. Uh, I feel like I'm leaving too much details because the girls be the girls be invest- the, the girls, girls be investigating. investigating they be investigating they be bad investigating. but um but no like um let me drop this on you mm-hmm. someone thought I was Mr. Taurus yeah and I was like see there you go being a crazy ass fan oh uh uh-uh. uh don't know what you're talking about I'm not Mr. Taurus he's not Mr. Taurus I'm Mrs. Taurus he's Mrs. Taurus <laughs> Mr. Taurus Mr. Taurus is Nothing like <laughs> what y'all think. <laughs> Not at all. So. Uh, but no, I definitely, I definitely hope that that is um, something that you're able to get, you know, right, get together mm-hmm. before. Like I said, absolutely, um, absolutely. But well, we're gonna switch gears really quick. Um, you know, I met you um, last year in December. Yes. Um, through one of the greatest LGBTQ online platforms in America, in the world, not even America, in the world. In the world. Um, in the world um, chasing reality. And you are what I like to call the Chasing Atlanta Therapist. I am um, the official Chasing, chasing Atlanta, Atlanta Therapist. <laughs> yes. So for the girls that's been asking, baby, you will not take my spot. You honey. will not take the spot of Tawana Dixon. I, baby, can I give Andario a shout out? Give Andario a shout baby. out. And Dario had my name in the ending credits, boo. Like, that means something with your name in the credits. Yeah, that means something with your name in the credits. Uh, in the credits. So, yes, I love Andario. Shout out to Andario. Andario, we love you here on Talk Live Tuesdays. <laughs> and we're looking forward to all the things that are to come. <gasps> um, but being, I met you through Dominique, of course. Yes. Um, shout out to my Nenique. Um, how was it being able to get that experience to beat One Chase in Reality and to have a platform to show who you are and what you do. Okay. Yeah. So here's the thing. I, I, can I give spoilers? Yeah. I give spoilers. Because it's Talk Live Tuesday, right? Talk Live Tuesday. Talk about what you want to say. Talk about everything. Who going to check me, boo? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're writing a check. <laughs> Period. And that's the clear. Clear. Bad. All right. Okay. So I've known Dominique for years. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. I've known Dominique probably over 15 years. Or we mm-hmm. may break. Either way, go. So. Kind of growing up together, but not really growing up there. So I'm several years older than Dominique. Mm-hmm. Um, we always had like this pack right. that you know whoever like makes it first, you know, mm-hmm. we're gonna r- bring e- each other along. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've always, I kid you not, manifestation is for real. Mm-hmm. I've always had this thing where I manifested since I was a kid mm-hmm. that I was gonna be on reality television. Mm-hmm. And I always said I said I was going to be on MTV The Real World mm-hmm. because that was the show that was popping back then. Mm-hmm. And I had did the research and everything. And mm-hmm. you had to be 18 years old to mm-hmm. get on the show. And I even had auditioned for like a singing competition before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I did. And I made it to the next round. As you should. As I should. And so... Um, but Dominique, when he got on in season four mm-hmm. for Chasing Atlanta, um, he had called me um because you know they want to bring in a counselor because of the the fight at the at the spaghetti dinner or whatever you were hosting um i didn't have a spaghetti dinner i had a actual oh, lobster brunch i'm sorry yeah get it I, get it together i don't do, I, I don't, I don't no you saw linguine with lobster on the top and shrimp on the Excuse inside for the sweetheart Sweet, <laughs> oh no they weren't angel hair either sweetheart Listen. they were fettuccine oh. yeah Get it together, my my. We, you're not gonna disrespect my best. Come on, my, my best friend put his hard hard work into that Shout into that to food, this. honey. I like him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm. You know, I'm a little bit older. Uh huh. So things look different for me. Uh huh. Don't do that. Troy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get him together by my bitch, y'all. Y'all look. Yeah. <laughs> Talk like Tuesday. Okay. So <laughs> I got called uh-huh. about the incident. Mm-hmm. 
And um, and so I, whenever I came up, I think I came up the next week or mm-hmm. something. And so um, we filmed for season four, and mm-hmm. I want to say that was episode six. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had filmed, and you know that was that moment that me and LaKendra had, mm-hmm. and that was a very powerful moment. And mm-hmm. I remember, and Dario texted me. While the episode was airing, we was talking about that moment. Mm-hmm. And of course, with editing, they had to, you know, of course, cut it yeah. down some. But that moment went longer. Yeah. And it was very powerful. Yeah. Um, and from that, people started reaching out. Mm-hmm. Um, I know someone had reached out to Cameron about therapy because Cameron ended up contacting me. Like, people started reaching out to, like, cast and, you know, yeah. trying to find yeah. me. Yeah. And so... That actually opened the door for me to get licensed in Georgia. Mm-hmm. So me being on Chasing Atlanta season four for mm-hmm. that one episode opened the door for me being a licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia. So I got online, stepped into my inner candy burst, mm-hmm. and I was like, how, how can I secure me a Georgia bag? Right. And I started you know, doing my research, mm-hmm. and I met all the qualifications, you know, because by me already being licensed in Alabama for so long and all these different hours, I had already passed the exam, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So all I had to do was submit the application, mm-hmm. submit the, the check, all mm-hmm. that good stuff, and I was licensed in Georgia. And so then fast forward to last year um, when Dominique called me about uh, filming for season five, mm-hmm. I honestly, I don't know if I had told you this or not, mm-hmm. I told Dominique, I said, I would film, but at some point, I want to work with Troy. Mm -hmm. And I meant that. I was like, that's the only way y'all are going to get me to show my bald-headed self back on that TV show (laughs) if I get to work with Troy. And so, when I had got the email that Troy was going to be there, I was like, this is my moment. Yeah. (laughs) Because I had wanted to work with you in season four. This is my moment. That's what I felt like. I was like, you know, I I wanted to work with you then, but so much was going on. I was like, this is going to be the moment and it's gonna change Troy's life forever. Yeah. And so when we met and we that was a fun night. That was a fun night. Yeah. And yeah, that's how we got it going. Well you have changed my life forever. You already know how I get out. Oh God, don't you start when you said that it just shook me on the inside. But you know you definitely have changed my life. But we're gonna <sighs> Anyway, yeah. um, but no, um, being that you did do um, Chasing Reality, um, is there anyone else on the show that you feel like you would want to work with or you would want to um, sit down and chat with? Um, yes, there is. So I definitely um, I definitely had wanted to reconnect with Kendra mm-hmm. for season five, but that didn't go as planned. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Rico with a K, I would have liked to have worked with him. Um, I've, I've I've seen Rico with a K mm-hmm. several times yeah. outside of the season. Yeah. Um, but as far and I've already you know I've worked with Cameron mm-hmm. um, in season four. But anybody else for season, I definitely would have wanted to work with Willa mm-hmm. um, and connect with her. And I would definitely say um, Ike. Mm-hmm. And probably Aaron. Aaron? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely Ike and Aaron. I would have definitely loved to have filmed with yeah. them and just kind of see, you I know, love all of those people. how life is with them. Yeah. Um, everyone else I had ever worked with, like I filmed with Wayne in season mm-hmm. four. Um, yeah. Yeah. But definitely Ike and Aaron. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and so you spoke on that you did um, become licensed in Georgia. How mm-hmm. did that happen? Um, once again, just me being on the show mm-hmm. um, and people reaching out. Mm-hmm. I mean, because people was literally contacting me like, yeah. oh my God, I need therapy. I need therapy. I need mm-hmm. therapy. Um, and not just our people, mm-hmm. but people that don't look like us. Yeah. People that don't even identify with our lifestyle mm-hmm. were reaching out to me. Um, so, of course, like I said, just got online, start typing, got on the um go, the Georgia uh, state website, mm-hmm. and I just saw what it took. It was like I needed two years in my current mm-hmm. state, which was Alabama. Mm-hmm. I already had over two years. Mm-hmm. Um, submitted the application. It was a very quick process. Mm-hmm. It really was. So by the time season five rolled around, yeah. I was licensed yeah. for the state of Georgia. Okay. Um, also, you know, since being licensed in Georgia, 
and being on the show, that even opened up the opportunity for my teaching position mm-hmm. um, as well. Because, you know, I you do. T- mm-hmm. I am a professor, unbeknownst to popular belief. But <laughs> hey, Professor Ogilvy. <laughs> but I am a professor. I do teach in the graduate studies for mm-hmm. um, human studies um, at a university in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And so, um, love teaching. All of my students are working on their master's degrees. So I'm dealing with adults. Mm-hmm. Um, so, all of that just kind of opened up opportunities because, you know, once again, a coworker had saw me on the show. Mm-hmm. And this person wasn't even my coworker yet. Right. And when they became my coworker, they was like, Have you ever thought about being a professor? Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, girl, they ain't finna let me be nobody professor. Mm-hmm. And she, um, that, that lady literally, contacted like the department head and all that and was like hey I know this therapist and he is going to be a great fit for the Mm. department Um, he's a black man he's a part of the LGBT community Mm -hmm. y'all need him he's straightforward he's relatable like she put in this word for me and I, I became a professor so you know I'm going to say this, and this is not to shade anyone, but it may come out as a little shady. Mm -hmm. I literally had to stop being around certain people, Mm -hmm. and I had to change the way my narrative was going Mm -hmm. in order for me to walk into the blessings that I was supposed to get. Because sometimes people can be a hindrance to us. Yeah. They can be a hindrance to us. Yeah. I never, if it, I want to, I want to always associate myself with people that are in high places. Mm-hmm. I may not be at that specific plateau, mm-hmm. but I want to be able to know that I can go higher. Mm-hmm. And the people that I was hanging around, mm-hmm. they, they didn't, they didn't want to move forward. Mm-hmm. And I'm all about moving forward. Yeah, always. And I had to really terminate those relationships. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself going to be licensed in any other states or? Yes. And how, what what would be your next state if you were thinking? Um, Florida. Florida? Florida would be my next yeah, state. Yeah, shout out to the, the state with the oranges. You know that's where yeah. I'm from. So here's my thought process. Mm-hmm. I always try to aim for the states in which I frequent the most. Mm-hmm. And you know I'm in Miami like every year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Florida would be the next state, then Nevada, because mm-hmm. I'm always in Vegas. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the states that I'm always like traveling to the most will always mm-hmm. be like the ones that I do see myself being licensed in okay. so that way when i am vacationing i can spend time and make me a bag as you should yes okay. you know we always want to get to the bag wherever we're going i made a, i was making some coins today <laughs> right from the conference of my hotel room <laughs> online do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> well uh well, we're gonna take another quick break um and then we're gonna get into our last segment of the show and we're just gonna talk about you know just therapy and yes. therapy in the black community yes um so we're gonna take one more quick break and we'll be right back here on our live tuesday's attack we have none other than twine dixon my counselor my therapist here on the couch we'll be right back Gonna just you know get to our next segment of the show as we get ready to wrap up, but we do want to definitely talk about um you know therapy mm-hmm. and um therapy in the black community. Right. Um, but first of all, where did you get your first start as to being a therapist? Okay, so I actually um when I was an undergraduate mm-hmm. at the Jacksonville State University. Go Gamecocks. Not Jackson State, y'all. He not Jackson State. I'm not an HBCU. He girl. didn't do an HBCU, but you know I am an HBCU girl. Y'all know how I feel about that because y'all seen that on the last couple of shows. You know, right. I had, um, I actually had worked at HBCU for a short period mm-hmm. of time. Worked. Never again. Didn't attend. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but go ahead. Well, I'm glad I didn't attend at this point. Okay, great. You see where fam, <laughs> you, you see fam, you put me? Mm-hmm. Entrepreneur. They did. I, I like FAMU. I love FAMU. Yep. Um, go Rattler. Shout out to Homecoming this week. But anyway, go ahead, Mr. So, so I had originally went to college for nursing. Mm-hmm. I thought that was what I was going to do. I was in the military at the time. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to make so much money as a as a black male nurse in the mm-hmm. Army. Um, so I had originally went to school for nursing. But then um, and got accepted into nursing school and everything. Mm-hmm. But then I had realized that wasn't really my passion. Mm-hmm. I don't do bodily fluids. Mm-hmm. 
I I just did not have that type of time right. to invest in that type of career. Right. And I have plenty of friends that are nurses, nurse practitioners, doctor of nursing practices, all these wonderful things. Um, but I knew that my skill set was helping people mm-hmm. in some sort of capacity. Right. So on my 21st birthday, I actually went and changed my major to psychology. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my grandparents and other people of my family who have never seen a college campus, never uh, seen, stepped foot on the college campus, never went to the financial aid office, never went to the admissions office, never went to the housing office, nor went to the cafeteria, nor went to a football game, but only watch it on TV and be rooting for schools that their coins did not go to, <laughs> had an opinion. And I don't feel that you should have an opinion on something when you can't differentiate your from your. (laughs) Okay? So, their opinions did not matter. And they were not funding my education. (laughs) Okay? So, I changed my major to psychology. And yes, I knew that I was going to need a master's degree Mm -hmm. in some sort of field where I could land a career. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, in 2009, Mm -hmm. um, I was actually the president. It was my senior year. I was the president over the African American Association. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a diversity inclusion event Mm -hmm. on campus. And so I remember talking to one of the advisors over in the education department. Um, and I actually saw her Saturday um, at our at our Black Alumni Weekend. And um, I remember talking to her in 2009 about having, you know, an education piece for this event. Mm-hmm. And she said, why don't you have a counseling piece as well? And she said, go to, upstairs to the counseling department and talk to Dr. Turner Mm -hmm. and Dr. Kaiser. And I went up there, and I ain't know nothing about no counseling Mm -hmm. degree. I went up there, and I met with Dr. Turner and Dr. Kaiser, and they said to me, they said, well, you know, we, I instantly had a connection with them. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, when do you graduate? I said, well, I graduate in the spring. They said, well, are you going to get a master's degree? I said, well, I don't know. They said, why don't you get your master's degree in counseling? And I asked those two men, I said, what is that going to do for me? And they sat down with me, and those two men invested in me. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed for the counseling program. I was the only male accepted in the counseling program Mm -hmm. that that year. Um, And I ended up getting my master's degree in counseling. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I had to follow all the qualifications and, you know, requirements in order to get licensed and take a national exam that no one can ever get me to take again because that test was hard. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, we got licensed in Alabama because I live there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it it was more so all about the education and the testing and getting the supervision hours. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, you become a counselor. Mm -hmm. But as far as the career itself... Um, I really had to put myself out there. Mm -hmm. And I say that because when in the state of Alabama, who, you know, Alabama still has its moments of segregation Mm -hmm. and discrimination, I had to make sure people saw me for who I was as a professional and who I am as a professional Mm -hmm. and not what you think my lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't verbally tell you what I choose in my personal life that has nothing to do with my professional life. Right. Which is why I'm an entrepreneur now. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so I can remember I would be interviewing for jobs and I actually, in my career, I was actually fired from three jobs. Mm. And as I got older and of course all this happened in my twenties, mm-hmm. I was fired from three jobs by three white men that were intimidated by me. It wasn't that I didn't do the work. Right. It's just that you were intimidated that this black boy, but I'm a black man, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you were intimidated that I was educated. Right. And that's, that's very intimidating. It was uh, it's very intimidating mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. And I was educated in a profession that you didn't think black people supposed to be educated in. Right. And I was young and in my twenties. So you had to make an example out of me. But it wasn't an example that to you you thought you was making an example, mm-hmm. but I used that 
as molding. I use that as creativity. I use that to say, yes, this is a part of my journey and a part of my narrative and that I'm going to educate and help others right. overcome that. Right. Because it does happen. Yeah, it does. We are judged because we are black. Yeah. We are treated a certain way because we are black and mm -hmm. gay. Yeah. And my mentor always told me to stay three steps ahead of the game. Yeah. Because I am black. I'm still a male and I am gay. Yeah. So that's why I'm always pushing, advocating for me and others to always stay ahead. Yeah. You know. Um, so that happened to me um, in my career. And the only leg those three white men had to stand on, this was three different jobs. Mm -hmm. The only leg that they had to stand on, Troy, was Alabama is an at-will state. So you didn't terminate me based off of me. Anything you did, they terminated you right. based because they just they could. Because they could. Without, because, without reason. Without reason. Mm -hmm. And one guy, I'll never forget, he told me, he said, we're going to need for you to go out the back door. You know what I told that man? I said, no, bitch. I'm going out the front door. And I pranced my happy ass right on out that front door. Sure did. Mm. I sure did. As you should. I went home and cried. But <laughs> no, I, but I, I, I'm sure. But you're not going to tell me to go out no back door because this is not 1963. Right. It's not. Yeah. So I'm going to go out the front door and I'm going to go out with some confidence. With some confidence and take my pride with me. Yeah. Period. 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 Well... Um, being that you, um, what, being that you went through those things, um, where did that put you at in your life? Like, how did that, how do you feel like that molded you into where you are now in your life? It molded me to have a voice mm -hmm. for who I am as a professional. Mm -hmm. It molded me to never alter my character for mm -hmm. anyone. Yeah. I'm not going to alter me to fit your mold. Yeah. I'm not gonna alter me to fit a space. Mm -hmm. You know how you know how you ever hear people say, "Oh, you should walk a mile in my shoes." No, the mm -hmm. hell I shouldn't. Them shoes was designed and formed for your feet. Right. If I put my feet in your shoe, we may wear the same size shoe. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be uncomfortable for me because. That's not my journey. Okay, okay, Those right. shoes are designed for your journey, right. not mine. Right. So no, I would not walk a mile in anyone's shoes but my yeah. own. Yeah. Because they were formed for my journey. Yeah. So, yes, those experiences taught me to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And it taught me to not be bullied. Mm -hmm. And I've had jobs where I've had, in my career, where I've had to stand up for what was right and mm -hmm. advocate for what was right and advocate for what's ethical. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, and one of my favorite jobs I had in my career did one of the most unethical things to me. Um and and I and I'm glad I stopped it when I did. Mm -hmm. And from then on, they actually disliked me, and it's okay. I mean, they never terminated me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I resigned, um, but it wasn't because of that situation. Mm -hmm. It was just time for me to grow. Right, I had right, ca right. I capped out on my salary. Right. You're not going to pay me forty anything. Right. Not even today. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so I had capped out on my salary. Um, but anywho, they, this particular company I worked for, they were getting their first transgender mm -hmm. client. Okay? And this was an inpatient facility. Mm -hmm. and they were getting their first transgender client. And this client identifies as female, right? Mm -hmm. And they say to my supervisor, okay, now mind you, I was a therapist in the men's program, mm -hmm. okay? I get called into the office and they told my supervisor, okay, we got our first transgender client. We're going to make uh, Antoine their therapist since he's gay. No. No. That program has a assigned therapist. Right. So because you, there's a transgender client, you think you're going to, you know, Man, scapegoat. Yeah, yeah, you're going to scapegoat your way out. That doesn't work like that. Yeah. And... Troy, what happened was that particular client, mm -hmm. we went to grade school together mm -hmm. when they were a male. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't have been their therapist anyway. Right. And they say, well, y'all just know each other from when they were a male. You don't know them as a female. Either way, I know them. Right. I know them at the end of the day. Right. Male to female, female to male, whomever they choose to be. Right. I still know them. Right. Their family knows my family. Right. 
ain't no way it's gonna happen. I don't know. Yeah. That's just unethical. Yeah. And I had to nip that in the bud, and I had to nip that in the bud on the fact of that you decided to, out of your irrational thought process, mm -hmm. want to assign me a client mm -hmm. who is transgender. All because you have a gay therapist on staff. Mm. But what I did say was, when did I ever tell any of you guys that I was gay? Mm. When? When? Just because I got a little switch in my walk that makes me gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, I had to get them together. Yeah. Because I never, I never said that to you. It was nothing to hide. But there's, that's not a topic of conversation for me in the workplace. Right. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, um, definitely had to confront that situation. Yeah. And I knew then on that at some point in my life mm -hmm. that I was going to transition and fully work for me. Yeah. Um, and I was scared. I was scared. I was like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. So, I kept just building my career, working mm -hmm. these different jobs, working under someone. Mm -hmm. But I knew eventually I needed to work for me. Gotcha. And I became a entrepreneur full time mm -hmm. on April the first of this year. Mm -hmm. And you know, I got you know, I got something yeah. dropping real soon. Yeah. I saw I showed you. Yeah. Um, so everything is going well, but it definitely took a lot of building. It definitely took me having to really stand my ground. Mm -hmm. Because they're gonna be there I hopefully there are other male gay male counselors that come after me that mm -hmm. look like me. Yeah. And that I can help them. Right. You know. Yeah. So being um, in the black community, um, why do you think that people in the black community are afraid to go to therapy? Because of the fact that they don't want to appear as weak mm -hmm. or less than or that that they have some sort of mental issue. Mm hmm. Yeah. And why do, why do you think that they perceive it as being weak? Because you know, we that stigma mm -hmm. that when you hear about people going to counseling, oh, they got mental health problems. Mm -hmm. They crazy. They psychotic. Mm -hmm. People do have those real life issues, mm -hmm. but because of that's how the picture was painted, it was never. Oftentimes, it had not been painted that mm -hmm. you can go to therapy just as an outlet to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. Someone that doesn't know you, that's not a part of your family, mm -hmm. that's not a part of your friend group. Mm -hmm. But because of how society paints a picture, or at one point in time painting a picture about therapy, as the people being in straight jackets, you in mm -hmm. a mental institute, right. you in solitary confinement and right. because of your behavior, and you doing all types of crazy stuff, it was perceived as only crazy people mm -hmm. go to counseling. No. No. We all have real life issues we all at some point you know have issues with finding balance or on managing anxiety stress depression mm -hmm. you know just and i always say this you know people doesn't have to be don't have to be diagnosed with depression to exhibit the symptoms of depression mm -hmm. um we we worry a lot and sometimes we just need that outlet yeah. people have relationship issues mm -hmm. You know, they have fornication, you know, high, yeah. high sex drives and things. Yeah. Addiction issues, addiction beyond drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people have strained relationships with their parents. Mm -hmm. So we deal with a lot of different things. We deal with a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. People have been hurt by others, sexually abused. Mm -hmm. You know, and they still haven't faced that. Right. Because they may have been sexually abused growing up. They don't know how to function. Right. When in, in an adult relationship. Right. Or navigate friendships. So people come to therapy for a variety of things. So what do you think is like the number one topic that you get when you're getting someone to come to therapy? Um, I would definitely say, and I don't know if it's because of the holidays rolling around, mm -hmm. but here over the last couple of months, I have been getting a lot of people who are having issues in their relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not seeing the couples. I may have, I think I may see one or two couples now, um, but I try to stray away from that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I do lately. I've been having a lot of clients who have issues in their relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, do I want to stay in a relationship? Do I want to stay married? But it's, you know, just kind of working through those different things mm-hmm. and coming to find out that. A lot of times people are in relationships with the same person. Mm-hmm. And I say that because as I'm exploring relationship patterns, mm-hmm. it's the same pattern with each person that someone has dated. It's just a different first name. You're dating the same person over again. So it, I always try to encourage my friends, let's look within mm-hmm. to see how can we change this pattern? Mm-hmm. Because you're comfortable dating this type of person. That it keeps being the same person over again. They just have a different first name. Mm-hmm. It's almost like that DMX song, mm-hmm. Keisha, Tisha, mm-hmm. about three Kims. Yeah. That's kind of like what people are going through. And I, I, I will say, I, my first three relationships mm-hmm. all kind of went the same way. Mm-hmm. They all kind of boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of realized I was dating the same person, too. Mm-hmm. The last person that I was dating, I was in a relationship with them. But I was kind of glad they ghosted me and left me mm-hmm. before we could even get to a state of... We're solidifying a relationship or we're doing whatever because I began to realize he was like those last four. I yeah. mean, those last three. Right. Now, Mr. Taurus mm-hmm. is not any of them. Nothing like that. Nothing like at all. any of them. Like, I literally posted on my, on my Instagram story today where he said to me um, over the weekend, and if we were just in the house and he said to me over the weekend, I asked him to do something for me. He said, you just let me know what you want from me. He was like, this is your world. I just live in it. Mm-hmm. And when he said that to me, I was like, literally, what the entire fuck? Right. Excuse my language, y'all. Well, I, I can cuss this my damn show. Right. But what the entire fuck? Like, Absolutely. What? Mm-hmm. And I had to sit back and was like, is this is this a real thing? Like, is this, is is he playing me? Is he just saying this in the moment? What if, like, because I had never had anyone right. tell me that before. Mm-hmm. And I caught myself at work today just like, and I text him, I was like, you know, I just, you've been on my mind all day. I've been thinking about you all day. Yeah. Because I had never felt that before. Like, no one's ever, but mm-hmm. you can tell when someone's different. But I literally, mm-hmm. I know what you're saying, because I literally was dating the same people. Yeah. Over and over again. It may have been the walk of life that I was in or who, right. who I was at the time. Mm-hmm. But I realized when I changed myself and I put myself in a different standpoint, a different place mm-hmm. in my life, someone new came that was nothing like anybody else. Yeah. You know, and shout out to Miss Stars. I, there have been conversations we've had mm-hmm. about him. Mm-hmm. And when we've had those conversations, I would go back and be like, what kind of person is that? Mm-hmm. Like, they make people like him? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow. Mm-hmm. And that's why I would be so hard on you like, okay, Troy. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you're a psycho. <laughs> Bitch, get it together. You know, and I'm like, Troy, no, no, no. Because I... I would be like, really, this this is like a person that, honestly, we all kind of want, want mm-hmm. or desire mm-hmm. that we wish that we had. But a lot of times people get in these relationships and they're trying to create that person. Mm-hmm. And then now you're stepping into a different role. Mm-hmm. Now you're stepping into like a parent role yeah. or some sort of manipulating role or some sort of leader role. Mm-hmm. When... We should kind of be on the same playing field, mm-hmm. you know. Even in my own situation, we had to take a we had to take a pause. Yeah, we had to take a pause because we just need to take a pause. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good today. Mm-hmm. You know, because we had to have. Girl, I'm gonna cuss in my child. I'm gonna cuss your slap. Ow! But go ahead. We're we're good today. Mm-hmm. I gotta get you on it. But mm-hmm. we're good today. Mm-hmm. And it, we're gonna, we were good yesterday. <laughs> but the thing is, the reason why we had to get to where we're at, mm-hmm. because I needed them to understand, right, where I'm, where I'm positioned, right, where I'm seated, mm-hmm. and I'm okay with where you're seated, mm-hmm. but don't let that seat 
get too cold. Right. You know. Yeah. Because it can't get empty. It can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, what do you tell someone who feels like, you know... I don't. I want to go to therapy, but I don't have to approach it, or I don't know what to do, or I don't want to seem weak, or I don't want to seem crazy. What do you tell that person when they when they come to therapy, or when not just someone that's thinking about it, that have not that that wants to get there, but they don't have the courage to to step out and do it. You know, honestly, I people do ask me about therapy all the time, and they ask me in in confidence or in private, and I I do share my response to them. It's based off of whatever they present to me, mm-hmm. okay? Um, but I always make sure that it is known that even for me as a therapist that I'm in therapy. Mm-hmm. And I haven't shared that with the hell I go to therapy for. Yeah. Because I want people to know that I'm realistic. Right. You know, I don't give TV therapy. Mm-hmm. We're all human. We're all human. Mm-hmm. You know, I even tell my clients... There's no right or wrong dialogue or language to use in therapy. So whatever words you want to use, use them. But please don't have me breach confidentiality if you report anything about wanting to harm yourself or right. wanting to harm others. Right. You know, allowing my clients that space and that safe space to be open and honest and transparent allows the work to be done in therapy and outside of therapy. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking at someone who has pulled me to the side to think about therapy, I have that talk with them based off of what is being presented to me. Mm -hmm. And I also ask them, would you like me to help you connect you with some therapists that I Mm -hmm. know? And I know some really good therapists, Mm -hmm. some really good therapists. Of course, I'm always advocate for the therapists that look like us. Right. That's not to be racist or anything. Yeah, no, definitely. But that looks like us. We're black around here. Yeah. Because others can't understand us how we understand mm-hmm. us, okay? Yeah. No matter how, if you grew up in the upper echelons, or if you grew up middle class, or if you grew up poor, we all can we can relate to us. Because yeah. people that grew up high and mighty, mm-hmm. they dealt with something because they had to live a life that they wasn't really feeling. Yeah, You get what I'm saying? So, I definitely make sure that I'm asking people... Would you like me to help you find some mm-hmm. resources for therapy? Yeah. You know, especially like with my friends and stuff. Of course, I can't be their therapist, mm-hmm. but I can connect you with people, you know. Um, and then we, we have, you know, more dialogue as it relates to like mm-hmm. paying for therapy and yeah. insurance and all that. That comes. But just really pushing them and just, and I always tell people, at least try it for a few sessions. Mm-hmm. See how it goes. Yeah. You know, set a goal of, you know what, I'm going to try about six counseling sessions and see how this goes. And if you got a really good therapist, mm-hmm. you're going to be there for a while. Like, I, I got a, I have clients that have been with me probably almost two years now. Mm-hmm. Every, like, just me doing therapy on my own. Mm-hmm. They've been with me for a couple of years. I've been with me for a couple of years. I don't see them every week. I may see some, like, bi-weekly or some mm-hmm. just kind of once a month. But they build me and and they keep me updated with things. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll email me. Um, we have like our communication chat. They'll just kind of keep me updated mm-hmm. on things. So getting a good therapist and really building their report. Every therapist out there are not good therapists. And that's mm-hmm. realistic. There are therapists out there that are not good. They're just in it for a check. Right. And you'll know when you're connected with a really good therapist because it really comes from their heart. And it comes from how they facilitate therapy Mm -hmm. and how much they invest in you. I'm Mm -hmm. very invested in my clients. But even being invested with my clients, I still have to turn it off and not let it go into my bedroom, into other parts of my house. I can't let it go that far. I I stop responding to messages and emails after a certain time because I still have to have boundaries and degrees of separation. But definitely, it's still an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. But we're definitely advocating and pushing forward, yeah. pushing for people to go to therapy, not pushing for people to go to therapy just to be spending money. But mm-hmm. if it's truly needed, if you truly want to try it, we're going to advocate for it and push you and encourage you to do it. But there's a difference between encouraging and forcing. 
Yeah. I always tell people, I can encourage you to do it, but I want you to do it at a time that you feel is right and best for you. Shit, it took me all the way being licensed before yeah. I started going to therapy. Right. You know, and I've always heard the therapists need therapy too. Mm-hmm. I've always heard that too. I even see that even on TV shows. Yeah. Law and Order is one of my favorite. Like when you see them going through something, they, they go talk to their therapist too. Even after they don't talk to one of the crazy kids or yeah. the, the serial killer or whoever, they go talk to their therapist about what has yeah. happened in, in with them that day. So, yeah. no, I, I definitely get that. Yeah. Um. So, final question before we take a quick break um, and wrap up the show, but where do you see yourself going with your therapist career? Um. Every day, my prayer is that the good Lord above continues to bless my multi-million dollar business. Mm-hmm. I may not have a multi may not have millions in the bank right now, mm-hmm. but as I continue to manifest it, I will. Mm-hmm. So I want everybody to know. Remember this episode that I did manifest that thing. I've been manifesting all all the time. Um, honestly, I really just see my business expanding, mm-hmm. especially with the release of some things that's coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, I really see it expanding beyond Alabama, beyond Georgia, but that's going to take me having to remain persistent. Yeah. And um, so I definitely want to be all over the world. Um, my ultimate goal is to continue to, you know, do speaking engagements. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the things I've always wanted to do is to definitely be a motivational speaker mm-hmm. and to continue to be booked for different speaking engagements. And that is starting to happen. It started to happen in 2020. Then the COVID happened mm-hmm. and, you know, I got discouraged from it, but, um, you know, I, I started praying about it and doors mm-hmm. have been opening. Um, so being able to continue to do speaking engagements, doing podcasts, I want to be able to do things that keeps me connected to our community. Mm-hmm. I want to do things that keeps me rooted and centered in our community yeah. because I'm never above anyone. Yeah. I'm never above, I always heard in the church, you're never above reproach. And that is so true. Yeah. And so I always want to do things that where I'm being a real person, um, and that everything I do business wise, it helps to bring more to our community yeah. and just clinically, because that's the term we like to use in the therapy world, mm-hmm. that the services that I provide to every client that I work with impacts their life in a progressive manner mm-hmm. and not a regressive manner. Yeah. Okay. That's all. That's where I just see myself business wise and, you know, Hell, if I'm going to be real, have long this chase of reality to try and want to keep going. Let's keep doing we're it. We're going to keep doing it. So Let's keep doing in it. In whatever direction we're going to keep going in, I'm, I'm here. You're here for work. I am here. All right, you guys. Welcome back to Talk Live Tuesdays with Tag. I am here on the couch with Mr. Dixon. Now, we're going to talk about our topic of the week. And the topic of the week is Kanye West. Ooh. Kanye West. Now, of course, in the media lately, Kanye has been... Um, talking recklessly online. He's been going back and forth with his wife for the last couple of months. Um, recently, he just made some statements about Jewish pe- Jewish people mm-hmm. um, online. And uh, he's been dropped by a lot of brands, especially by the one that I worked for. He's been dropped by Balenciaga. Mm-hmm. He's been dropped by Vogue. And Anna Wintour has cut ties with him. Um, today, Def Jam Records cut ties with him and his record label. Um, he's just been... Let go by a lot of people mm-hmm. and with just with his comments and his actions within the last couple of months and then especially with the comment that he made about the Jews within the last couple of weeks, I mean within the last week, has had him, you know, pretty much terminated from a lot of things that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, so my first question is, do you feel like because a lot of people love to say, Oh, Kanye's a genius, Kanye's super smart, like this is just Kanye, y'all don't see what Kanye's trying to do. But when he made that statement about, you know, slave Slavery being a choice and all of these things, um, you know, do you feel like Kanye is super just this genius and smart or has Kanye or now we're seeing that Kanye is actually um, has a mental health issue? Um, okay. Well, I would say this and I'm just mm-hmm. going to be completely honest and transparent. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be um, honest and transparent as a professional counselor and honest and transparent as a human. Please. Okay. 
Um, I've never been a Kanye West fan. Um, the only song I ever have liked was The All Falls Down with Selena Johnson, because mm-hmm. I love Selena Johnson. Um, yeah. I would say this. I do think that there is some mental health issues there. Mm-hmm. Um, there could e- also be some physical health issues mm-hmm. present as well. I do hear a lot of people on Beyonce's internet saying, you know, that he's a genius and mm-hmm. I've been seeing this over the years. And hey, I'm not going to take anything away from anyone and their creativity. Right. But what I am saying is, I will, it was quite alarming several years ago when his mom passed away Mm -hmm. and I was concerned about him then Mm -hmm. Um, especially given how the media put out how close they were Mm -hmm. and all of these things Mm -hmm. Um, I don't none of us know him personally right Uh, some people may feel like that they do Um, but we don't know him personally so professionally I've always been concerned has there ever been been any help sought out for him? Has he ever sought out any help since the passing of his mom? Mm-hmm. And you know what? They did diagnose him with bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. And he said that he was not he, I think he was taking medication at first but then he stopped taking medication which is when him and Kim started having uh, marital issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he did seek some kind of help but do you think that someone should actually be a friend and step in and say, hey, you actually need to go sit down and maybe talk to someone. Because I do, I honestly do think that the passing of his mother is the reason that mm-hmm. he has been like this over the past couple of years. Because the last two years to be exact, he's really been out of control, like loose yeah. cannon. Well, that goes back into play about, you know, how the old saying go, you can lead a horse to water, mm-hmm. but you can't make them drink. Mm-hmm. There probably are people mm-hmm. advocating and saying, hey, you should go seek some help. Mm-hmm. So they, they're doing their part. And this is something we always, especially working in substance abuse. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to use that as an example. I used to always talk to families when I worked in substance abuse about um, the difference between being a healthy support person for your loved one versus being an enabler. Mm-hmm. Okay. Support people, yes, they're going to encourage you and they want the best for you. Mm -hmm. And they're going to help lead you to the water. They can't force you to drink, but they're going to lead you. Your support people are also going to help set an example for you Mm -hmm. and not put you down. Mm -hmm. But they want to keep encouraging you and lifting you up, um, making sure that you have like your basic needs. Get where I'm going with that. Enablers, because they want you out of their face, they're going to I get out of my face. You ask for ten dollars for something to eat. Go get something to eat. But they're not really going to get something to eat. They're going mm-hmm. to go feed that drug, right? Yeah. They're going to go feed that addiction. Mm-hmm. Kanye probably has a lot of enablers. Mm-hmm. Like, y'all just let him get out there and act a fool. It is what mm-hmm. it is. We'll just yeah. di- we'll just we'll just type up a statement and put it out there that we apologize. Mm-hmm. That he apologizes. Mm-hmm. But how much how much enabling are they going to continue to do? Because as he's losing things, that means your team is going to be losing things as losing well. Things as well. Mm-hmm. And folks got mouths to feed yeah. and homes and lights to keep on. Yeah. And I said that I wanted to post today and it was like, well, Kanye's going to make money for the rest of his life. And Kanye has a catalog that he can make money from. Yes, Kanye's going to be able to make money off his music. But Kanye didn't become a billionaire just off of his music. Right. Kanye became a billionaire off of the many endorsements deals mm-hmm. that he has and the people that he works with and things that he does behind the scenes that a lot of people don't get to see. Mm-hmm. So you can't just say his music. And if he continues to go on the path that he's going, he may be worth a billion today. But when they start taking away all those endorsement deals and once they sell his last pair of shoes with Adidas or they do whatever and all that stuff is gone, where's that money going to come from then? Mm-hmm. So, and you know, even with music, you know, they can stop playing music too. Yeah, they can stop playing music. They can stop streaming. You they, may have, yeah, they can do all of that. They can pull stuff down. Yeah, you know, um, because people, like, a lot of people don't know. If we're gonna look at the music thing, not every artist, like the publisher, owns the, the music, song. Yeah, like the not artist, every artist owns their music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, um, the publisher can pull that. I remember yeah. one R and B group. It may have been Seven O Two. I don't even know who that is, sweetheart. Where my boys at from the front to the back? Where my girls at from the front to the back? Where my girls at? Seven O Two. Yeah. Um, they live here in Atlanta. Sorry. <laughs> like music soul child. The lead singer is his baby mama. Um, yeah. Um. So anyway, they I were trying. Yeah, you do. Okay. Um, where my girls at? For I said, where the boys at? I guess we're gay. Sure. <laughs> where are the boys? Where? But they were trying to do something, and the publisher. It was it was an interview um, mm-hmm. about something, and the publisher would not release like mm-hmm. a snippet of the song that the this particular show. Yeah. It was like one of those behind the music things, but yeah. it wasn't that. But and the the narrator of whatever the episode was was like, due to publishing rights, the publisher did not release. Yeah. But, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So like you can be a writer on the song. Yeah. But and you're not the publisher. publisher. Yeah. You don't own that. Yeah. So you know, so even with his music, yeah, he'll make money off of it, but it just kind of depends mm-hmm. on the nature of that too. Yeah. Do you think that with him Spiraling how it is Do you think that eventually with him Not getting the help that he needs That it could lead to possibly You know Some kind of addiction to Or maybe even death Well To be honest To be very realistic We You never want to rule out death from anything Yeah, de- yeah. Like that's just being realistic Yeah Um it can lead to that if you don't take care of yourself. Yeah. Because when we talk about, okay, he he stopped taking medications. I have had so many clients. Even, I met with a client today that, you know, told me, well, I don't take this medicine anymore. And my first question, every time I hear a client say, well, I don't take this medication anymore. I always ask, did you discontinue that medication on your own terms or did you actually meet with the provider, the doctor that prescribed that medication for you, and y'all agreed to terminate that medicine? Right. I already know the answer, but because I'm a therapist, I need the client to take yeah. ownership and accountability that, hey, mm-hmm. I discontinued this medicine. Yeah. And then I'll tell me, and I'll say, listen, this is what I suggest, because mm-hmm. I can't tell you what to do, but my suggestion is contacting that doctor, setting mm-hmm. up an appointment, Talk to the doctor about what issues or what you feel as though as it relates to that medication and explore the options. Mm-hmm. Maybe the dosage is too high. Mm-hmm. Maybe you need to try a different brand that mm-hmm. doesn't make you feel this, that, and the other. But before you discon- discontinue something, talk to the medical professional who knows about the medicine mm-hmm. more so than you do, more so than what Ms. Google can provide you. And explore the options. Maybe Kanye didn't explore options. Mm-hmm. And he's not the only one. A lot of people, celebrity or not, they are discontinued medications. And they will start spiraling. Because when you do start a medication and it does get stabilized in your system within about 21 days. And your body has been used to, hey, I, this is a part of my daily feeding. Mm-hmm. And this is... Some would help. You may feel as though it's not helping you, but it mm-hmm. probably is helping. You discontinue that, and you discontinue what we like to call cold turkey mm-hmm. without actually transitioning off of it. Then, yeah, you do start to, your body is kind of doing things, your mind playing tricks on you, you're seeing things or whatever. You start hallucinating, you start having auditory hallucinations, you start having visual hallucinations. Right. You start, you just kind of just start going down different paths, right. especially with that bipolar disorder. And as a therapist, if we're looking at Kanye and him having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, mm-hmm. he could have a comorbid diagnosis mm-hmm. of schizophrenia. Because those symptoms are, they look very similar. Mm-hmm. So a lot of, you know, psychiatrists think they have to give a, um, they have to give a primary diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But I can almost be for certain, if it's not even public information, just with my years of experience, I can almost be for certain that there's a schizophrenia diagnosis there as well. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Well, I'm hoping that Kanye gets the help that he needs because uh, I will say I was a Kanye fan. Um, Mm -hmm. Kanye was someone that I did look up to. I did think Kanye was a great creative. Mm -hmm. Um, I did love his music as well as his his fashion and his style. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, he's Mm -hmm. always been, he's been with hand in hand with Balenciaga for a while. And so Mm -hmm. the fact that I was able to be a part of the company and him being a part of the brand, it kind of was like, you know, but um, I do hope that he gets the help that he needs. Um, but as we get ready to wrap up our show, um, I do like to encourage my audience and let mm. my audience get some encouragement. So before you leave, um, just give my audience a quick word, and whether it's a word of advice mm-hmm. or whether if it's some encouragement about therapy or whatever is on your heart right now, just look into the camera and let them have it. Okay. Um, I hope everyone really enjoyed this episode. The Fun moments, the, you know, petty moments. But I hope you got something out of it. But just in life in general, whether you're part of the LGBT community, whether you are, you know, a black person, person of color, whomever you may be, whatever you desire in life, for real, manifest it and go for it. You may not have people that support you. They may not understand it. They may not understand the direction that you're going in. But whatever you want out of life, I always say get ahead of the fear. Get ahead of what that fear may be. Because fear, we do have it. And fear can sometimes hold us back. But it's going to be important that you get ahead of the fear. And as it relates to therapy, don't be afraid to talk to someone. You know, a lot of people say, well, I talk to my pastor. A lot of times that's cool for what it is for that moment. But there are people like me who aren't a pastor, who Mm -hmm. are trained and skilled in this profession to provide this service. Help is always available. And lastly, do not be afraid to make yourself a priority. Before you can love anyone else, ask yourself, how much do I truly love me? And if you don't love yourself as much as you love everybody else, it's time to start loving yourself more. And so that means spending more time with yourself, identifying the things that you do like about yourself, love about yourself, taking care of yourself, going to implement a self-care routine. Don't be afraid to love yourself and make yourself a priority. And those are the things that I had to do to get to where I'm currently at because I'm going bigger places. Right. You know. But I had to reconnect with me and love me first. So I'm advocating that for everyone. Well, Mr. Dixon, I appreciate that. And I want to let you know, you know, I really appreciate you. You know, I love you. And thank you for even taking the time out to do my show and come down to Atlanta um, during your busy schedule. And also, uh, thank you for what you've instilled in me over the past Mm -hmm. couple months. And so I've been knowing you almost a year now. And, um, you know, you've helped me through so much. You've helped me through the who I'm dating right now. Mm-hmm. You've helped me through a lot of hardships in my life mm-hmm. this year. It's a lot of things that a lot of people don't know. And it's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of people wouldn't know. I probably wouldn't have made it out of this year if it wasn't for you. Yeah. So um, I definitely want to just um, give you your flowers and thank, thank you. you so yes. much for all that you do yeah. and all the people who lives you're helping yes. each and every day because, you know, it's people like you that help people like me get through. Yes. So, um, Thank you again. Um, Always. And shout out to you for doing your thing. Um, make sure you guys follow him on Instagram at where? I mean, sorry, not Instagram. He doesn't have one of those. On Facebook. You know, I I had a little IG. My inbox was some serious. Child. <laughs> what about DM? DM. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from the old school. But definitely, you can follow me on the local Facebook. Um, you can find me, Twan Dixon, LPC. Um, if we do not have more than 50 mutual friends, I'm probably not going to add you. Um, so I apologize in advance. So make sure we have about 50 or more mutual friends before I add We're going to talk about that, guys, because how is he going to grow his platform if he's not adding people? You have to add people to grow. So, because if people don't know you, people are not able to share, share your posts or see you're what you right. on Facebook, you won't get anywhere. So, we're going to get um, Auntie. Um, 49. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get Auntie here some, you know, 
some social media help, but I, I, I'll do that for her. Thank but um, thank you so much again, Mr. Yes. Dixon, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Always. Again, you guys, y'all already know what it is. It's your boy Tag Did It, and we are here live downtown in the lock in Atlanta, Georgia, with another episode of Talk Live Tuesdays with Tag here with Mr. Twan Dixon, LPC. Absolutely. Thank you again. We thank appreciate you. you. Boom. Boom. You had to do it. I know you had to do it. Thank you again so much. Bye, y'all. You know where we at? It's time to sip and check. Get to the back and tell them that tag. Get it.